Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Lee. I'm an obstetric anesthesiologist at Columbia University in New York City. Today, we're going to discuss the evidence supporting best practices for selection and administration of vasoactive drugs during cesarean delivery, with a special focus on norepinephrine. Cesarean delivery is one of the most commonly performed surgical procedures worldwide. Neuraxial anesthesia is the preferred technique. And in the US, over 80% of elective cases are performed with spinal anesthesia. Spinal anesthesia is associated with a high incidence of maternal hypotension. The maternal effects include nausea and vomiting, and rarely cardiovascular collapse. The fetal consequences include decreased uteroplacental blood flow and acidosis. The cause is sympatholysis from the T4 to T6 sensory level required, and this is exacerbated by vena cava compression by the gravid uterus. The problem with the hypotension is that the uteroplacental circulation is maximally dilated with limited capacity for autoregulation. The positive so side is that blood flow exceeds the minimum necessary to meet fetal oxygen demand. And we know that compensation for decreased uterine blood flow can occur by increased oxygen extraction. On the negative side, decreased blood flow during maternal hypotension can be compounded by a reflex rise in endogenous vasoconstrictors which results in steel of blood to the lower limbs, and then compounded by the administration of exogenous vasoconstrictors. The target maternal blood pressure should be maternal baseline. Borgnanke and colleagues showed that when maternal blood pressure was maintained at 100% of baseline, there was higher umbilical artery pH, slightly higher, and less maternal nausea and vomiting. Okadaira and Suzuki showed that greater than two minutes of hypotension was associated with higher levels of oxygen free radicals in the fetal placental circulation. When it comes to preeclampsia, the threshold for treatment is unclear. We know that there are lower vasopressor requirements and that ACOG suggests not giving antihypertensive agents when the blood pressure is less than 160 millimeters of mercury systolic and 110 millimeters of mercury diastolic. Basically, the decades of evidence make it clear that fluids alone are ineffective for the treatment of hypotension with spinal anesthesia. Vasopressors are key and prophylactic dosing versus rescue dosing is recommended. Let's talk about these drugs individually. Ephedrine. Ephedrine is a classic sympathomimetic amy with indirect adrenergic agonist effects through the release of norepinephrine and relatively weaker direct adrenergic agonist effects. The indirect effect probably accounts for the relatively delayed onset, but the beta agonist action results in less bradycardia. Therefore, in the setting of hypotension and bradycardia, ephedrine may be preferred, and the longer duration of action may be preferred in the setting of labor in a woman who is rem remote from delivery. In certain circumstances, like the parturient with regurgitant cardiac lesion, where bradycardia needs to be avoided, the uh, ephedrine may be preferred in that circumstance. Another advantage is the ability to give the drug intramuscularly. That gives it a long duration. And it's controversial, but some experts suggest that the drug may be of value in the setting of uterine hypertonus and fetal bradycardia by relaxing the uterus based on the beta effect and raising maternal blood pressure. Because it's more lipid soluble though, the problem is that it's more likely to cross the placenta and the drug can then exert fetal metabolic effects. Phenylephrine is now considered the vasopressor of choice. It's a direct alpha-1 agonist, has faster onset and short duration, making it very titratable and perfect for use as an infusion. There has been some concern about reactive hypertension at higher dose ranges, but there have been no adverse effects reported when these are studied in healthy patients. It's important to point out that in the setting of bradycardia and normal blood pressure, stopping or reducing the infusion rate is preferred because treating the heart rate alone can lead to spikes in blood pressure. Norepinephrine, which we'll get a bit more focused today, has an increasing number of studies assessing its efficacy in obstetrics. The drug has potent alpha-1 and alpha-2 agonist effects and less potent beta-1 and beta-2 effects. It's therefore not associated with the bradycardia and decrease in maternal cardiac output seen with phenylephrine. The short onset and duration also make it suitable for, for bolus administration and infusions. 
we don't have time to discuss the influential animal studies over the 60s and 70s. However, in summary, they noted concerns that vasopressors decrease uterine blood flow at all pressure levels, except for ephedrine, which had no appreciable effect on uterine blood flow. The criticism of these studies is that they do not mimic the clinical setting. There are differences that we now know between humans and, and sheep. We also know that uterine artery vasoconstriction is probably not as significant as previously assumed because of a lack of direct sympathetic innervation of the uteroplacental circulation. Ephedrine, apart from slow onset, higher nausea, vomiting, and tachyphylaxis with repeated administration, crosses the placenta more easily and has fetal metabolic effects. On the other hand, there have now been numerous studies showing the safety of phenylephrine, and we now know that there is superior neonatal acid base status associated with phenylephrine. And the reasons for the differences in you know, human and animal studies is probably because of differences in placenta morphology. Warwick Nanke's seminal randomized controlled trial comparing placental transfer and fetal metabolic effects of phenylephrine and ephedrine showed higher umbilical arterial and venous levels of lactate, glucose, epinephrine, and norepinephrine in the ephedrine group compared to the phenylephrine group. The more lipid-soluble ephedrine has greater placental transfer than phenylephrine, and that's what explains the metabolic effect in the fetus. Phenylephrine, although we keep saying it's considered the vasopressor of choice, still has concerns because of the dose-dependent reflex bradycardia and the fall in maternal cardiac output. And though they appear to be well-tolerated in healthy patients who've been studied, the concern is that there's some evidence that maternal cardiac output may correlate more closely with uteroplacental blood flow than maternal blood pressure. When compared side by side, clearly, phenylephrine reduces maternal cardiac output compared to ephedrine, and this is correlated with heart rate changes. I want to say a few things about non-elective cases. Uh, the use of ephedrine versus phenylephrine have been compared in emergencies, and there isn't a clear difference. And a meta-analysis found there's probably insufficient evidence to make a recommendation regarding the choice of vasopressor in non-elective settings in high-risk patients. In emergencies, there's probably a shorter induction to delivery time, and also in laboring women, they have lower vasopressor requirements. So these fetuses are probably just exposed less to vasopressor drugs. So why the excitement in the OB anesthesia world about norepinephrine? Well, this has to do with the limited effect on heart rate and maintenance of maternal cardiac output. One of the concerns has been the uh, extravasation risk and a tissue injury, but that has not been shown to be any different than phenylephrine. The risk of major complications has been studied after using uh, peripheral norepinephrine infusions, and no complications have been reported that required medical or surgical intervention. And the patients most at risk seem to be critically ill patients with um, circulatory shock. The interest in norepinephrine, as I said, is because it has a fairly neutral effect on heart rate, and the positive chronotropic and reflex negative chronotropic effects tend to balance each other out. Warwick Nanke explored what doses would be relatively equipotent, and it looks like phenylephrine 100 mics corresponds to a norepinephrine dose of about 8 mics. When administered as a prophylactic infusion, the 2.5 mics per minute dose seems to maintain maternal blood pressure effectively with no detrimental effect on neonatal outcome. The following year, a report indicated that rates of 0.05 to 0.075 mics per kilo per minute are effective. Investigators in India found that norepinephrine 5 mic boluses versus phenylephrine 100 mic boluses were, com when, co when compared, there were fewer boluses needed in the norepinephrine group. But they reported, unlike Warwick Nanke, that there were slightly higher umbilical artery pH in the phenylephrine group. Warwick Nanke's publication in 2015 indicated that umbilical artery concentrations of norepinephrine and epinephrine were lower in the norepinephrine group. Glucose was higher, but there was no difference in lactate. So they, uh, they can uh, uh, attribute the difference to fetal catecholamine levels, not placental transfer. 
there was actually higher umbilical artery and vein pH and oxygen content in the norepinephrine group, which indicates less stress. They think the higher umbilical artery and vein glucose could have been from higher maternal glucose levels, but that wasn't measured. Finally, a study from China showed that when they compared prophylactic norepinephrine and ephedrine infusions, um, there was lower blood pressure and higher lactate in the ephedrine group. So can we say that norepinephrine is the superior agent compared to these others? I don't think that we have the evidence yet to completely back this up, but it is promising. That's all the time I have. And so I would like to thank you and hope for, to see you again at a future meeting in person.